Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. With tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit descends to burn in our hearts anew. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Like the rush of wind, we sense God's presence blowing afresh throughout the world. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Across the barriers of language and culture, Christ's message of love and grace is heard. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Divine Advocate, we seek your guidance as we search for the Spirit of Truth. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Remembering the resurrection of Jesus, the dawn of new light on Easter Day, and the Spirit's tongues of fire descending, making church of us all, we gather now in the light of this day. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Holy Spirit came to Jesus' disciples hidden in a stairs room in Jerusalem. A violent wind and tongues of fire are symbols of a new thing happening in their living. May your Holy Spirit burst into our lives this day, encouraging, equipping, and inspiring us to proclaim boldly the good news of Christ who offers healing and hope to all. Hear us and speak to us and speak through us as we hear the music and words of the prayer Jesus taught us. Uh, later in the service, uh, 
We will uh, share in the prayers of the people, and if there are people you would like to remember, simply email the first name only to me, and uh, we will pray with you. We will not be alone as you pray, and uh, we will do that for you. A few things also, um, Zoom coffee hours are complete for this time. Um, I know that there are a variety of things that have been reopening and so on, but if something untoward happens and we have to be closed down again for some strange reason, um, then uh, coffee hours will resume so that nobody is alone throughout the week. Um, I encourage all of you as your uh, age category arises, it appears that everybody's is almost there. Um, uh, I know that uh, my children they're in their early 20s, and uh, they're, uh, one has a shot, and one is waiting for next week for theirs. But as your category comes up, please uh, go get your inoculations so that you're protected, and so are the other people around you. I can tell you from the board meeting last week that we're going to be having um, church services throughout the, throughout the uh, month of July, and in August we'll be closed, uh, so that uh, I can all have a holiday, and so can you if you wish. Um, but we'll try to provide resources for you so that you'll know where you can go for services uh, during that uh, month of August. Those are the announcements that I have in front of me at this time. Uh, are there any other announcements that need to be made? We hunger for the light and the strength that only the Spirit can bring. May God feed us and strengthen us as we learn to feed others. May God fill us with the breath of the Spirit as God searches our hearts. And may God take our lives as proof of our faithfulness. May God take our gifts as proof of our love. To use them for God's purposes here on earth. We take time to present to God our gifts and offerings on this day. And after the music and the doxology, we will offer our gifts to God in prayer.
us in the Holy Spirit. Take these our gifts, signs of the lives that you have given to us, O oh God. Bless them as we give them to you. Use them for your work in the world. In Christ's own name we pray. Young people, how many of you have ever been in a race? How long was the race? Did you win? I remember my son, he was a young guy, and he was, uh, he was running in a kilo run about this time of the year. You think about that for a minute, what races you have been in, perhaps you've been running in school at some point. Luke tells a story. A story about the very first Pentecost. Penta means five. The Pentagon in the United States has five signs, and, and it represents the 50 days that are after Easter. Luke reminds us that when Pentecost Day arrived, everyone gathered together in one place, and suddenly a noise came from heaven that sounded like a violent wind. The noise filled the house where they sat. Then fiery tongues spread out and sat on each person there. And everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in foreign languages as the Spirit directed them to. Mandy was pumped for a very big race. It was her very first 10 day run. She worked out for six months, running with her parents and riding her bike and skating long distances on her rollerblades, and she really believed that she was ready. She lined up at the starting gate. On your mark, get set, the starter yelled, and then the gun went off. Bang! And everyone made a mad dash for position. Mandy ran her fastest at first, and then settled down to get into her rhythm. Mandy looked at the course, but, but she focused on her breathing. Mandy always liked to be like her mom. The high school cross country champion, the, the college competitor. Her mom still had trophies and ribbons from those days, and she had new ones too. Mandy saw her mom race the victory many, many times, and now it was Mandy's turn to win. Her mom watched her race. Go, Mandy, go! Mandy saw her mom yelling. Mandy waved at her mom and then returned her focus on her breathing. In and then she returned to her race. In and out. And should she save her energy? Or should she try to pass the girl who was in front of her? She decided to pass the girl. As she came closer, her lungs let her know that she was straining. And there she passed one girl only to see another. Should she pass her? Yes. Mandy sped up and passed the next girl only to see yet another. Did she have enough energy to pass the next girl? Or should she wait and save her energy for the sprint at the end? Out of the corner of her eye, Mandy could see the 5K sign. She was close to the end. Now she had to make some choices. Go faster now or at the end. Her lungs were moving, and her heart was pumping like crazy. Then she saw her mom yell and heard her say, You're in third place. And he decided now was the time to make her move. She put all her energy into a sprint and passed the next girl. She came closer to the leader, and 
joint with all her focus on the leader, but her wounds wouldn't let her. Her chest began to hurt. Stand the leader, she thought to herself. On the last turn, Mandy was the lead in kicking and began to sprint. Mandy didn't know she had enough strength to keep up, but she decided to try and sprinted as hard as she could. In spite of her lungs, she was surprised she still had the strength to run. <laughs>
The scripture reading today comes from the Old Testament from Isaiah chapter 11. We often hear it in Advent. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Luke writes in the book of Acts these words. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jewish people from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jewish people and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others stared and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of John, beginning at John 15 and 26. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said these things to you to keep you from stumbling. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, an hour is coming when those who kill you will think that by doing so they are offering worship to God. And they will do this because they have not known the Father or me. But I have said these things to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me where are you going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, 
about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world is condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you've ever had that, that slightly embarrassing experience of having someone give you a gift only to find out when you opened it that you didn't have the foggiest idea of what it was or what it was for. I mean, there you are, you're at your birthday party, and somebody hands you a, a lovely wrap package, and as you pull off the ribbon and the wrapping paper, and all the eyes around you are on you, you open the box, and there it is. But is it a pencil sharpener, or is it a coffee grinder? Is it a scarf, or is it a napkin for the table? Is it earrings, or is it fishing lures? Of course, the person who gave you the gift is looking at you with eager anticipation as if to say, well, do you like it? And finally, out of courtesy, you have to say something like, oh, how could you have known? Thank you so much. I could really use a tire pressure gauge, only to have that wounded voice say something like, tire gauge? It's a big thermometer. There's something in that same sort of uncertainty and perplexity about Pentecost. You've heard the story. The leaders of the early church were all gathered in one place when suddenly there was the sound of rushing wind like a tornado. And then tons of fire appeared resting on every head. Each one of them began to speak the gospel in other languages. Here on Dramatic fashion, something has been given to us, the church, a gift from God. But when we open it up, what exactly is this gift? What's it for? Well, the gift is the Holy Spirit, of course, and on Pentecost, God gave the church the gift of the Holy Spirit. And to be a part of the church is to say, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you take the wrapping paper off, what exactly is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Is it a pencil sharpener, a coffee grinder, is it a tire gauge, or a meat thermometer? You know, some people are fascinated by the drama of the story, the power of wind moving through the congregation, of tons of fire resting on people's heads, and they say, Oh, I know what the gift is. The gift of Pentecost is the gift of energy and excitement in the church. Pentecost was God's way of, of shaking the moss off the church, blowing the cobwebs out of the sanctuary, and allowing electricity and excitement to energize the church. Well, if that's the gift, God knows we must need it. Energy and excitement in the church. That's a, that's a good thing. It's a very special thing. Well, some other people have suggested that maybe the gift we receive on Pentecost is the gift of power. I mean, after all, Jesus did say to the disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. And if it's power that we receive this day, well, then God knows we must need that, too. But wait a minute. Pentecost only gives power. But it's not clout like the world's power. If there's power at Pentecost, it's more like the power of Jesus, which may look like weakness and vulnerability, and that's pretty strange power indeed. It's not the kind of power the world thinks of as being power. And the gift we receive on Pentecost is the, is the one gift we most desperately need, and the world needs. And strangely enough, it seems one of the gifts of Pentecost is the gift of something to say, or to speak, and the brokenness and tragedy of the world that we live in, and it's unlike any other world. Did you notice 
what happened to the church when the Spirit was given. It stood up. It spoke. And from silence and language and it talked, and the whole world heard the good news in their own language. A word to speak in the brokenness and tragedy of the world, a word of good news and hope is unlike any other. Maybe that's the gift that we receive today. Energy and power, and those things are gifts to be sure, and a word for the, the brokenness that we live in day by day. Those are gifts, to be sure, on Pentecost Sunday. But the truth is, we often know the gifts of the Spirit through the gifts we experience in our living that God gives day by day. Earlier we heard those words from Isaiah, which said, A shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of strength, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And while the prophecy of Isaiah pertains to the Messiah, the tradition of the church is that those same gifts are extended to all of the faithful, to you and I. Confirming this belief, St. Ambrose taught, Recall then that you have received the spiritual seal, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of right judgment and courage, the spirit of knowledge and reverence, the spirit of holy fear in God's presence. Guard what you have received. God the Father has marked you with his sign. Christ the Lord has confirmed you and placed his pledge of spirit in your hearts. You know, this is a weekend when in the past we often had confirmations at church and in administering confirmation, the presider prays, extending hands over the confirm, and says often something like this, All-powerful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by water and the Holy Spirit, you freed sons and daughters from sin and gave them new life. Send your Holy Spirit upon them to be the helper and guide. Give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of right judgment and courage, the spirit of knowledge and reverence, fill with the spirit of wonder and awe in your presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord, and then confirms them in Christian faith. In some sense, we know the spirit's presence in our living through the gifts that the spirit brings into our lives. You know, the ordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit in some sense in our day-to-day -day living, not the special ones that Paul would go on and talk about. Things like wisdom. See, wisdom is the ability to see things as they, as they are in an open-minded manner. Wisdom is like a pair of glasses. It's the gift we need to see reality properly. Without wisdom, we tend to see only things from our own perspective and from our own point of view. And we usually associate wisdom with older people, because living a long life tends to give people a broader perspective. But young people can be wise, and when young people have wisdom in what we say, they're wise beyond their years. Wisdom. Understanding is relational. A heart that accepts and cares and listens and understands and forgives. And I think of understanding as the kind of knowing that we do with our hearts. We turn to the understanding person when our hearts are heavy, knowing that he or she will listen if we want to talk and be quiet if we don't know what we want to say. Those who understand us know our faults, our imperfections, our strengths and good qualities, and such people are ready to encourage and challenge us and always ready to forgive us and give us another chance. And I think it's safe to say that most of us would like to be a lot more understanding than we are sometimes. Most of us have to admit that we need an increase in the gift of the Holy Spirit in terms of understanding. 
the gift of knowledge. It's the ability to comprehend the truths of the universe. Knowledge is a gift we seldom attribute to the Spirit of God, but the ability to think and to know of all is one of God's greatest gifts to human beings. It's a gift we need to make sense out of this complicated world that we live in. The ability to know is a gift from God. And the development of that gift, well, it's our responsibility. That same power could be used to find a way to defeat a hungry family or to negotiate lasting peace. We need the Holy Spirit's gift of knowledge to help to know and to help us to use well our personal and collective stores of human knowledge. To give the right judgment. It's the ability to make good and wise decisions. Our greatest gift as human beings is the gift of freedom and the gift to decide for ourselves what we want to make of our lives. And God's gift of right judgment helps us to use our freedom wisely. We need the gift of right judgment when we're faced with everyday choices, as well as important decisions in our lives. And this gift helps us to see a situation clearly and to look at all the options that are open to us, analyze the possible ramifications of each option, and then to make a clear and decisive choice. The Spirit often works with others in giving us this gift. So important is that the part of right judgment is seeking advice from people who have more expertise or experience than we do. Right judgment also helps us to learn from our mistakes, correct the problems caused by bad decision making. The gift of courage, sometimes called fortitude, is the strength to do what's right in spite of challenges. Courage is the gift the Spirit gives to help us follow through on good decisions once we've made them. It's the strength to do the right thing in spite of the obstacles and difficulties that make it hard to do so. Spiritual courage helps us stand up for our moral values and our convictions. The gift of courage gives us the strength and the stamina to keep on trying day after day to be the kind of Christian person that we would like to be. Reverence, sometimes called piety, is a deep respect for God and a deep respect for all of creation. Reverence is respect with a capital R. The Holy Spirit's gift of reverence helps us to see the true value of every person and all created things. We need reverence for life, and reverence for nature, and reverence for people, whether they are old or young. Reverence for truth and a reverence for God. The person gifted with reverence holds the world with loving hands. The seventh gift, wonder or awe in God's presence. A sense of the greatness and majesty of God coupled with deep realization of God's nearness. Wonder and awe in God's presence is the gift by which we are given a sense of who God really is and who we are as creatures of God. We need the help of God's Spirit to get to know this wonderful and awesome God that we serve, and we need a daily increase of in the gift of wonder and awe in God's presence. Wisdom and courage and wonder and knowledge and reverence and understanding and right judgment. On this kind of past Sunday, we were reminded of these seven gifts of the Spirit, these seven experiences of God's Spirit. Give us a sense of, of the profound gift in the coming of God's Spirit, used in making the church of us all. Coffee grinder. Pencil shot in the hole. Energy, excitement, the power of something good to say to a broken world, wisdom and courage and wonder and knowledge and reverence and understanding and right judgment, the powerful gift of, of the Holy Spirit in our lives and church today is a wonderful, wonderful gift. Those things that I mentioned today those sevenfold gifts of God's Spirit, we're going to hold those in sort of special reverence in this worship service. 
We're going to light some candles, and if you're close enough, you can see each one of these candles has a label and a correlate with those things that I just talked about. But I'm going to say with the gift of, for example, the gift of wisdom, and I will light the candle that says something about wisdom, and we will all respond saying, God, let us renew the face of the earth. So we're going to give this a try. These gifts and signs are signs of God's Holy Spirit present with us day by day. And it may be that you sense something special about one of those gifts, something that you need right now, or perhaps in this coming week. Well, these are the ordinary gifts of God's Spirit. If there's something that you hear that you need for this week, ask God for it. We can do that. With the gift of wisdom, let us renew the face of the earth. With the gift of understanding, let us renew the face of the earth. With the gift of right judgment, let us renew the face of the earth. With the gift of courage, let us renew the face of the earth. With the gift of knowledge, let us renew the face of the earth. With the gift of reverence, let us renew the face of the believer. With the gift of wonder, let us renew the face of the believer. Embrace the gifts of God and God's Spirit this day as you live your life, not only today, but in the coming week. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us bow in the morning. Move us, O oh God, of wind and flame, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Don't allow us to sit back and rest as though nothing important was happening. Remind us that you have come to bless, equip, and prepare us for your service. Now is the time of proclamation and celebration, and now is the birth of your church, not some exercise in futility, but as a dynamic group of people who know you and love you, as 
you know and love each one of us. Make us so joyful that we find it difficult to sit back and watch. We want to be part of your healing love and mercy and to be people who hear the word that your love for us is eternal, that Christ proclaimed and taught that love in all that he did and said and modeled for us as a new way to live. Inflame us and propel us forward into your world. Help us to remember this wonderful gift that you have given to us and that we need to be your followers. As we gather in this place today, we pray for many people whom we know. Think of Fred and his family, the tragic loss of his mom. We think of Elena and her family as they support and care even though they're wounded having known her themselves. We pray also for Ron, we pray for Tony, we pray for Marge and Mary and Margaret and Debbie and Sandra and Greta and Olga. These and countless others whom we know. Touch them with the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Remind them that they're not alone. And use us in whatever way you can as signs of your love and care and truth in this coming week. We pray for a broken world in which we sit, that needs the energy and the enthusiasm of your church, and, and of course a word to speak to that brokenness. Use us and others through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit in whatever way you can. We pray of violence and, and unrest in parts of the, the Eastern world and bombs and war and so on that just disturb to no end. Speak to that problem and that situation and inspire people to do something with it. It's so odd that people who are in conflict don't always see what's happening. That somebody is benefiting, but it's not them. Use people around them as signs of care and hope and truth. There's so many situations in our world today that need care and hope and truth. We need the gifts of your spirit. Cause hope to rise up with them. That this life might be made better for so many. Use us in whatever way you can in this coming week, O oh God, that we offer ourselves in Christ's own name. Allow the words and the music of our final hymn, Come, O Spirit, dwell among us, to speak your hearts and souls and minds.
gives rise to receive the benediction. May the power of the Holy Spirit transform you with a healing flame that unifies the world. May that first Pentecost teach you of God's grace, love, hope, and mystery. With tongues of flame, may you be marked for Christ. Go out in faith, abide in love, go with the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.